I've identified six key drivers that are going to shape the future that we'll live in for the next three or four decades. But the first, of course, is asymmetric world population explosion, going from 7.1, 7.2 billion people today to 8.2, 8.3 in 2030, up perhaps to 9 or 10 billion in the middle of the century. Enough said. You've heard about that before. The second one, of course, the second major driver is climate change. I don't think I need to add anything to that. The third one, of course, is the ongoing energy crisis because of climate change, because of the increasing number of people. We have unbelievable challenges in our energy. The fourth is the next wave of globalization. And then we come to the last two big drivers. And these two are at the point of convergence because the fifth key driver of the future are five major revolutions in healthcare, in medicine. And the sixth key driver of the future is exponential, accelerating technology development. Now, these last two key drivers of the future are currently at the point of major convergence. And that is why it is so interesting to wonder about its impact. Now, I said there were five revolutions in medicine, in healthcare. The first, of course, is DNA profiling. I stand before you as one of the quite few people now who've had my own exome decoded. I have a reasonable idea of some of the potential hazards and some of the potential benefits my own genome has. But DNA is perhaps one of the most useful tools we have to arrive, as you know, at personalised medicine. And what this means, of course, is that if we do have the information about a patient's DNA, we can be more selective in the treatments we choose for them. DNA profiling is going to be one of the most useful and central planks of medicine perhaps a decade or 15 years from now. Of course, the second big revolution in healthcare, in medicine, is stem cell research. I don't think there's anything that suggests that in 15 or 20 years, stem cell therapies and treatments aren't going to be central. But the implications of stem cell therapy are deeply profound. It means, for those who want it, not just treat treatments to deal with an ailment, it means actually the ability to regenerate tissue and cartilage, even organs. As you know, bladders and small kidneys and uh, an esophagus have been built using stem cells. Jump ahead 20 years, 30 years, we can see that for rich and perhaps vain people, the ability to have rejuvenation using tissue regeneration becomes a reality. The third major upheaval in medicine is nanoscale medicine. Medicine being enacted at the molecular level. Now today, we're only doing pretty simple stuff. For example, we are making very fine coatings to put around pharmaceuticals that have the properties of penetrating some tissues and not others, which means that we can deliver drugs to a specific point in the body and not being stopped elsewhere. For example, <coughs> if we have a tumour in a certain place, we can actually get our drug straight to it. But that's the simple part of nanoscale medicine, because what's coming is the development of medicines, drugs, that are manip manipulated molecule by molecule to overcome problems, such as side effects, or problems which may be to do with unwanted interactions. That is going to give us undreamed of therapies inside 10 years. So the fourth big, big change in medicine is the one that you're talking about at this conference. It is digital healthcare. If I were a physician and I was concerned about a patient, 
would I want my patient to wear happily a device that was feeding back in real time the patient's body performance? Would I want that? Of course I would. That's where we're going. That's digital health. But it's not just the watch. It's going to be a body network. And it's going to include many, many, many measurements of all different sorts, temperature at various parts of the body. It's going to have, in time, some semi-invasive techniques attached to it. And we're going to be in a situation in a very short space of time where all of us who care at all will have most of the simple tests done on our bodies regularly. The body network is where we're heading. The fifth big revolution in healthcare is one that you may not be ready for. It's robots. Now, you're all familiar with high precision robots in an operating surgery, helping to do very, very, very fine pieces of work. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about soft robots which are safe to be around humans, which can pick up an elderly person and pop him or her into a bath and help them out of the bath. How far are we away from those robots? No more than 10 years. But as robots become more and more intelligent, might they be able to actually fill in a lot of these gaps that we have in care? Now, nothing replaces a human, I hear you think. Probably true. But is there anything that can be as useful? Perhaps a pet? But a robot that can actually do things you ask it to, that's different. Will robots replace any part of doctor's work? Well, yes, of course it will. Um, one of the things that is incredibly difficult to know about, for example, are drug interactions. And when you're thinking about prescribing for somebody, you've automatically got to check, if you can, or think about it, if you can, the possible implications of the other therapies and drugs that the person is taking. But as the drug arsenal increases, this becomes harder and harder. Can a robot do that much quicker and better and more reliably than a human? Oh, yes. But I believe, and I think you would agree, the very large part of being a doctor is the personality of the healer and the, and the relationship with the patient. A huge part of that, to me, is inherently human. And I do not see that being replaced within any conceivable time frame that we can talk about today. The final drive of the future, this accelerating exponential technology development, is something which is the joker in the pack, really. And the reason I say it's a joker in the pack is we kind of don't know where it's taking us. Most computer scientists who have considered the issue think that at some point, some say as early as 2030, some people say 2040, others say much later, the point at which computers become as capable of problem solving as human beings. Think about where we're going when the computer becomes as capable as a human at problem solving. It's a point that futurologists call the technological singularity. And the reason we call it a singularity, the technological nature, is a bit like a black hole in space. Once you get to that point, no more information can come back. We can see no further, because what would machines that were many times more capable than we are, what could they do for us? What could they do for medicine? But will they be our slaves or our masters? Are we prepared? In no way. Are we talking about it even? Hardly. And what's going to be the outcome for our race? In the meantime, you have the job of applying the technology that arrives in the best 
possible way to help people. There is no more worthy thing in life than to help people. I salute you and thank you for listening. Thank you.